I was, I was mentioning to you, it, it's funny how our paths cross because uh, I did a solo backpack and trick myself. Uh, we're, what are we in 2023? I think it's 2021, September, 2021. I uh, packed my bag just by myself, never done anything like this in my life and left from uh, JFK to Lisbon, spent a week there. I felt that I don't know, just I, I got to a point where I was doing a lot of these touristy things and I wanted to what I call like spice it up and add more adventure, you know, to my trip. Um, did the Camino hike from there to Spain. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um lived in Ghana for two months and then uh Ecuador and Peru for four months. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 it was an interesting experience, and I'm curious to hear what you learned along your path. But doing something like that for the first time by yourself, with no safety net to fall back on, was very very interesting. So you when you mentioned the whole story of running a hostel, so yeah. obviously anyone that's going to be listening, some people will be able to relate, others won't. But I've always felt that in, in order to be in a position that you were in you at least have to try living in a hostel for a while before. <laughs> like that's a very yeah. different experience to be able to do what you did. And was I also, you said that was also your first time traveling by yourself? Well, in high school, I was a foreign exchange student in Costa Rica. So that was the first, I was 16 when I moved to Costa Rica with, I lived with a host family. Mm. Um, So while I wasn't with my family or anybody I'd ever met before, I wasn't alone, but I always find, and you may agree or disagree with this, but when you travel alone, you're actually never alone Um, Mm -hmm. because you meet people like you're never really alone. You end up, I don't know. I find sometimes I make the most amazing connections when I am traveling by myself Uh, because when you're with somebody else, you're more intimidating to other people. Right. And so the the chances of you might feel more confident or secure, but the chances of you engaging um, with strangers is lower, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have a built in buddy. So I've traveled in all sorts of ways. I've traveled alone. I've traveled with one other person, like a friend with a romantic partner. I've, you know, like traveled with a group of people and they all have their own special flavor, you know, and had, and then I also ran the hostel for five years. So, um, had the experience of being the home base for people as they were on their journeys. And so any of, and all of those were such unique experiences for me. Um, but I, I do think that there is something incredibly magical, um, about going out into the world and Mm -hmm. in whatever way, because you just, you're never the same again. No. You're never the same again, and I, I don't know if you've experienced this or not. I certainly have. <clears throat> when I came back, it, it, it was funny. It was interesting to be able to go into the world and experience this culture shock where all of these things were becoming new people, environments, the things that they were doing, and then just to come back and re- re-experience culture shock again because it's like, oh, wow, everything I knew, everything that I had as far as my own foundation is ba- and baseline – is a complete question mark because yeah. I had this thing and I don't know if you had the same thing. I came back to the States and prior to traveling, I had built my life around this concept of purpose and meaning and work and all these things. And then I came back after being exposed to all these different cultures. And I started to realize that, man, you don't really need to have a purpose to live. You don't really need to have this job that I give all of my time and energy to, to actually find meaning within a day. So it was, um, it was a complicated space to be in, for sure, for many months, I think probably five to six months, it took me to really uh, readjust and understand. And another funny story is I have a friend of mine that I met in uh, Ecuador, He's done a two-year solo backpacking trip, and I think he's coming back in December. Mm-hmm. So I'd be very curious to see what he is going to be like, because he yeah. would have been to every continent mm-hmm. when he comes back. Yeah, and it doesn't actually matter where he went. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. more, it's it's like I don't know if you're familiar with the hero's journey, mm-hmm. Joseph Campbell. 
there's this idea behind it where there's the separation, the initiation and the return, right? So uh, backpacking is like just such a easy way to look at the arc, right? Or the circular <laughs> situation, but the separation is leaving home, right? Like leaving to go on your trip. The initiation is going through a series of challenges and triumphs um, and, and really getting to know yourself. I mean, I think that's mm -hmm. a huge part of it. Even just like you're saying, mm -hmm. like, you learn that meaning doesn't need to be made through a job or through a way of thinking about the world. You were able to completely change what you thought the world looked like. And then the return, the return is, you know, the coming home, but to a home that you've never known before, right? yes. because you're completely different. So the meaning that you're making about the world in front of you is completely changed because who you are is completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that is something as a foreign exchange student in high school, you know, they kind of prepared us. Like, it's not going to be the home that you knew. Um, yes. And it's hard to really fathom that until you have the experience yourself. It's like me trying to tell you, I don't know if you have any children, but it's me trying to tell you the life-changing experience of having a child when you haven't. It's like, you can conceptually understand it, but until you have it, it's hard to really fathom, right? Just mm -hmm. like travel. It's really mm -hmm. similar in that way because it's like, it just changes everything. There's no way to ever go back to the way it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, I find it to be such a fascinating part of the human experience. And I highly recommend it for anyone who hasn't ever traveled to to get out there and, and experience the world because it will change you and, and for the better because it will help you see the world differently with more open eyes, hopefully a more open heart and open mind. Um, so. Yeah, what do you think rem what do you think remained the same when you came back did anything yeah you know that's a great question what remained the same for me i think i mean i it, i don't know which experience I'll, I'll go with my first one which mm -hmm. my high school foreign exchange experience coming home after that period of time what remained the same was that everybody else was the same they were still doing mm -hmm. the same things um, like I had friends who like, didn't even realize I was gone, like not close friends, obviously, but like who didn't <laughs> that I was gone to like, I had this return home party that my parents like put on with, you know, and, and this friend of a friend was in like, showed up and was like, Hey, and I was like, what are, he's like, what are we doing here? You know, I was like, Oh, I just got home from Costa Rica. And he's like, you were in Costa Rica. <laughs> so like, and then you like ask your friends, like, how was your summer or whatever? And most of them are still doing the same stuff. Like the world that you return to is this feels the same. I'm just different. It's like, they're still talking about the same drama and the same whatever, but like, I wasn't able to see it the same way. Hmm. Do you find that it, interesting that you mentioned that? Because I found that in my case, when I came back, I was in this space where I felt I had a tremendous amount of gratitude and appreciation for the things that I had. Mm -hmm. So starting from basic resources, and it's one of those things, once again, you can understand it conceptually, what it's like to not have a shower and to have to shower out of a bucket with a plastic cup. But it's a whole other thing to actually have to do that every, every morning and every evening, right. especially, let's say, when you don't have power, right? So then you got to go out in the neighborhood and fetch your water and all that stuff. And so... I found that when I came back, one of the things that changed for me was, and maybe this is just the way that I already was, I was so into this phase of depth, depth of conversation, depth of experience, where it became very um, challenging to relate to some of the people and circumstances because I felt that so many of the things were on the surface mm -hmm. and not yeah. really touching it. Like, so, so I think simultaneously, like, I came back wanting to be connected and yet ended up being disconnected yeah, totally. from a lot of the world. I always, there's an expression that I heard that I think is helpful to re, like kind of give an analogy to that feeling, which is mm -hmm. it's hard to talk to caterpillar people about butterfly things. Yeah. yeah. It's like you've gone through this giant transformational experience. You got into the goo, you bathed in a bowl. And like, you know, you, you like have to like, really get stretched to the max of your capacity typically like that travel is not always glorious or glamorous right mm -hmm. um maybe it's always glorious but it's definitely not glamorous um especially backpacking and but then 
you know, you come back and you want to talk about butterfly things. Mm -hmm. And it's hard if you can't. That's why it's so important to be able to find community to relate to. And that's why I call it the butterflies, right? It's like the other, those who have also chosen to go into a deep transformational process. And it doesn't really matter what it is. Um, there are lots of different things that are those transformational goos, right? Mm -hmm. Like grief, grief is another one, loss. Going through mm -hmm. a loss experience is a goo, right? And that's a transformational journey. If people choose to take that journey, travel mm -hmm. is another one. Um, those are probably like the two that are the most prevalent in my, in my life is like, um, and, and really going on like spiritual journeys of sorts, cause those can be deeply inward. Um, mm. they don't have to be, you don't have to go anywhere sometimes to have a spiritual journey. Um, mm -hmm. but that can be an awakening of sorts as well. Did you have a strong base or do you have a strong base, strong base, strong found community, strong foundation? Um, in what, like in life, do I now, like, do you now, or did, and did you, when you came back? Um, I had my parents and my brother who had all gone. My dad was a foreign exchange student when he was in high school to Holland. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like that shaped his life, um, and our family, right. Cause his experience. And then my brother had also done foreign exchange. And so I had my core home life, my parents, mm -hmm. my brother, my mom hadn't done that, but she was so, um, just such a safe space so mm -hmm. to share that it didn't matter had she done it or not she was mm -hmm. a, you know the love of a mother especially my mother so for me you know it was um i definitely felt really supported uh, my friends didn't understand as much mm. um, but because the home life was so supportive I felt like it was easier for me to not worry about the fact that the other kids didn't get it mm -hmm. you know um it definitely helped me connect with friends um I was in Spanish five when I got back like in high school so my senior year was Spanish five so the kids who had either grown up somewhere else you know there were quite a few kids in that like higher level Spanish class who there's this guy in there who I still remember Roberto but he was from Brazil and he had moved to the States when he was like 12 or something. So this was only a few years later. His English was really good, but he was wanting to learn Spanish. And so mm. like, I felt like I could relate more to the kids who had been born somewhere else and had moved to the States. Um, I found like that that kind of started becoming my community a little bit more. I was the same way. And the, the only reason why I asked that is because I found that for me, when I came back, not only did the surroundings begin to redefine, but it was also the community. I started to totally. redefine the relationships I was in. And, mm -hmm. and I think it, in some way, and I'm really glad that you've been mentioned this part of really encouraging people to do it because I'm a huge believer in the same thing. I think mm -hmm. getting, and, and look, the experience that you and I had to some degree, I think mm -hmm. it's possible even within the States. You know, oh, for sure. even outside going, of the city like, that you're in, national parks. Yeah, like going to a national park and spending a month as a park ranger is an, a foreign exchange experience in its own mm -hmm. right. You know, mm -hmm. I think you can have a domestic exchange. You go live in the middle of Kentucky and you're from New York City. That's going to be an exchange <laughs> experience because it's just a completely different world. Go live with if you're like a you know Christ, a white Christian kid go live with an Indian family and who's Hindu and like learn about their, you know, like if you did that, I feel like I've, I've really always wanted to have a domestic exchange program because I think that one, it would help heal some of the divisiveness that we experience as a country, mm -hmm. um, not to go too far to that, but like, and it would help us understand how similar we are, even though we think we're so different. Um, and so I feel like it would be a huge gift for people, especially young people, to go and experience what it would be like to live in another place, even if it's within their own country, mm -hmm. um, because it is, it's just a different, it's a different world, no matter where you go. Well, this is, I mean, and it goes back to the point how you and I even correct, connected around this, right? So you were one of the people that contributed to one of the moments worth remembering books and I remember when I had reached out to you as well as some of the other contributors because I really wanted to create this space or an additional way for people to 
celebrate and acknowledge some of these people that I think, uh, not that I think, I think at this point I know, I know go unacknowledged, unappreciated. I think it's true for many of us. I think and it's true for most most humans. I think it's true for most humans. And and that was kind of going to be my question to you or how we even began, began this conversation before the travel and then somehow bring it back to where it was. And it's like, why do you think we don't choose to express those things? Because sometimes we actually don't choose to express those things even not only until we die, but literally even that event doesn't bring up the opportunities to express what we mean to each other the fact that we love each other, what we're grateful for. Is that just that much of, um, not foreign language, but is that just that much of a language that we're just not comfortable in using? Or is there something else? I think that it's incredibly vulnerable to tell people how you actually feel about them. Mm. And I think it takes a lot of courage to express love because I think there's a fear of rejection. And so what if I tell you that I care about you, that I love you, that you're so special to me and you say, thanks, <laughs> but you don't say like you, me too, right? We have a perpetual um, problem of not loving ourselves enough that we're willing to put ourselves in a position to be vulnerable, right? Cause like, if I love myself, mm -hmm. And then, and I say, oh, like, like you are an amazing person. I love what you're doing in this world. And I'm just so impressed with you. Mm -hmm. And you don't say, oh, but Laura, you're amazing too. And like, you're doing great. Like, I don't, I'm not telling you so that you can tell me too. I'm mm -hmm. telling you because I, I believe it. And I believe it to be true. If I say, hey, dad, I just want you to know how much I love you and how grateful I am for the way that you raised me and for everything that you sacrificed in order for me to have a beautiful life. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, my dad's not awkward, but like, say like dad is like super sure. awkward. It sure. doesn't say like, Oh, well, you know, like, Oh, that was what I had to do or, you know, whatever, you know, like yeah. the thing that rejects the compliment essentially. I think we are so accustomed to rejecting people's compliments that I did a whole Instagram reel. I'll send it to you, but it's basically my daughter and I doing this like little role play where I tell her that she looks lovely and I like her outfit. And she's like, Oh, these are all hand-me-downs and my hair's a mess. <laughs> I had a terrible day. And she's not, she was eight when we filmed this. And, and then we do it again. And I, it's like, that was a typical way of receiving a compliment is like reject, put mm. myself down, dismiss, and, and that's normal, normalized in our society to reject compliments. Mm -hmm. You listen for it. Like women are the worst at it because they're like, oh, no, 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 no. This old thing, this was $3 at Ross or like, you know, whatever, even if you're complimenting the clothing um, or I look like a mess. I don't know what you see, but I'm exhausted. Right. So like, and then the healthy response is thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Or like as Isla and my daughter did in the video, she twirled around. She's like, thank you. I love this outfit too. You know? <laughs> and like that's like when, when people receive it, it feels like they took our gift and they said, thank you for the gift. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think that part of why receiving like love, a love bomb, like moments to remember, mm -hmm. it's so overwhelming because we're not used to it. Mm -hmm. And we're not used to knowing how to receive a compliment, money, like not unless we worked for it, right? Mm -hmm. Like if somebody gives you a gift of money, it's like, oh, no, no, no. Like you don't have to take me to lunch. I'm fine. It's fine. Right? Like think there. about how <laughs> often people fight over, my husband actually was the best because he was like, I'd be like, no, 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 I got it. And he'd be like, just say thank you. Somebody's trying to do something nice for you and you're you're rejecting the thing. Yes. And I was like, oh how did I not think of that so it like it's in every facet of our society how we like shut it down right and so the cool thing about moments to remember is that they can't reject it it's just yeah. given to them and it's already done and they could be like no 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 it's like too much or whatever but it's already there it's already mm -hmm. been created people already put their words and their heart into the message um but i i think that it's really really vulnerable to put ourselves out there because we're used to getting rejected mm -hmm. and we're afraid because it hurts and it's scary to like get rejected mm -hmm. well it's it's funny that you even mentioned the whole concept of 
rejecting whether it's free meal or free money because I instantly thought of times throughout my own life. I've definitely done that. And mm-hmm. I think the the other thing that's interesting about all of this, at least what I've learned, is that even with um, an elevated awareness around these things, there's still opportunities where you fall back into the same patterns, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like the difference now is, yes, I can become aware and yes, I can choose a different action. But I mean, that's not guaranteed 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. There's still that 1% of the time just due to the fact that the other thought pattern and other way of doing things is literally there every mm-hmm. step of the way with everything that we do, right? Well, there's a big yeah. unlearning that has to happen. It's a big unlearning. And I always say, like, I think of it like the river of like rejection, right? Like yeah. not receiving compliments, not receiving money, not receiving love, whatever it may be, right? That river is been flowing for a long time okay (laughs) so as we start to say thank you and receive Mm. it becomes a tributary off of the main river right and it starts like the trickle starts its own you know you can kind of visualize Mm -hmm. like a muddy path like getting drizzled with a little bit of water but like it's not doesn't have the big you know crevice (laughs) that like Mm -hmm. the river has right? So the river has the momentum, it has the big, deep grooves. And so to turn the river, it it takes consistent practice, right? Mm -hmm. But eventually, that other river is going to dry up. Mm -hmm. Like it's not a lot, it isn't, I mean, it might take a long time in the sense of continuous practice. But if every time somebody says like, Oleg, like, I love what you're doing with this podcast, or God, Oleg, like, you are just such a great guy, or, and you just say, thank you. And you like, really receive that, like mm. the tributary is going to grow stronger and the river is going to grow weaker. And eventually the tributary will become the river. Mm-hmm. What does that feel like? What does that feel like when you really receive that? Cause I think there's a difference between that and just solely saying, thank you as just another well, one of those starts, things. Like, you know, I think it starts as like, thank you. Like it's an uncomfortable. Okay. I think it starts with discomfort, right? Um, and then I think it's slowly, like, to me, I feel it as like a warmth in my heart. Mm. Um, and so, but I, I think it takes the practice of being willing to say it, even when it's uncomfortable, you can even start by saying like, this is uncomfortable and thank you so much. Right. Like, and then like slowly it becomes less awkward, mm-hmm. right. To say, just to say, thank you. And you don't even have to preface it with, this is awkward. Right. And then slowly <laughs> it becomes like, you just say, thank you. And then at some point you'll notice, gosh, like that felt really good. Thank you so much for noticing. Right. Like, it's like, mm. wow, somebody else noticed me. Um, Cause we desperately as human beings, we desperately want to be seen and heard and validated and understood and accepted as we are. And then when people actually do, it's like, is this real? Are you sure? <laughs> like, because it's so uncommon. Like, that's literally what I do with my work is I like help people feel what it feels like to be unconditionally loved so they can start doing it through themselves and feel what it feels like in their body so that they can com- start getting comfortable with receiving that love, that level mm. of love that doesn't have judgment, that doesn't have bias, that doesn't, that's not conditional. Right. Mm-hmm. And then as we get more and more comfortable with it, it becomes like, okay it's like this piece it's a piece mm. it's pretty amazing actually yeah I, I can relate to elements of it because <laughs> i i think and thank you for pointing that out um yeah. and i don't even have to press preface it with the awkward thing because it's just you know it's natural at this point but i think you were so spot on in a acknowledging that even just dis- even when it does feel awkward because I think that's what that's kind of one of the early things that I've discovered in breaking that awkwardness that silence because that's the that was at least for me the typical thing to do (laughs) if I didn't feel comfortable saying it then I might as well just not say it at all Mm -hmm. but then the the challenge is the more you do it the the more of the norm it becomes and then it becomes to the point where you don't express any of it and then you hide the emotions and everything else. And so it is an interesting journey as far as learning all of these things only to figure out what to unlearn. That's true. <laughs> Which is most of the things. <laughs> well, so many of the things, especially as it relates to our interpersonal relationships. Yes. Um, 
you know, my kids go to an alternative school because mm. it's all about, um, it's all about awareness of yourself and, and how we treat ourselves and how we treat others. And, you know, academically, you know, it, it may not be as focused on the academics of it, but to me, like being human, like the, the emotion, like being human means being an emotional, like having an emotional existence because we all do. Some of mm -hmm. us choose to suppress those emotions. And that's why so many people are sick, in my opinion, um, mm -hmm. because all that stuff gets stored inside of our bodies. I was a massage therapist in my early, early part of my career. And, you know, you massage somebody and they start to cry because there's this book that uh, is called The Body Keeps the Score. Yes. But, and, and there's another, uh, a woman who says the issues live in the tissues. Um, mm -hmm. which I love that, but it's true. Like as a massage therapist, I would rub somebody's neck and they would just start to sob. Like just feelings would come out because this, and they're like, I don't even know what that was about. I'm like, it doesn't matter. It came out of you. So that's like a mm -hmm. good thing. When things come out. Like we want them to, we mm -hmm. want you to cry. We want you to feel. And so that it doesn't come out sideways, right? Sideways is like, you know, like having anger that you don't understand, right? It's okay to be angry, but like having it be like violent or something that you're like, wait, I didn't mean to do that. Like what happened? Mm -hmm. And it's like, usually that's like, I've stored all these feelings inside of myself and I haven't expressed them. And therefore at some point they're just gonna like explode in weird ways. And we're gonna be like, what was that? You know, it's like seven people touched your boundary and the eighth person gets like an electric shock, right? <laughs> like. Well, maybe I should have dealt with that boundary with the first two people that I realized had touched up against something, right? But we don't have, we haven't been taught how to have the awareness around that. And so. Mm -hmm. Well, also at a certain point, I think it becomes harder to articulate what is the origin, right? Mm -hmm. Of the the problem that I'm experiencing. Because I, I think that's so true. The longer you let it go on, the more mm -hmm. information you're going to receive and the harder it becomes to identify like, well, mm -hmm out of all of the thousands of different things that have happened to this point, which one is it that I have to take on and, and confront, right? So I think having Our that awareness- Our bodies are pretty amazing at giving us that information, actually. Mm -hmm. Like if we're willing to listen, our bodies will tell us. Mm -hmm. When did you start doing a lot of this work? Well, you know, I think- What even led you on this path? Because this is a different path then I think most paths. <laughs> it's true. Um, well, in 2008, my mom was um, hit and run over by a car while crossing the street. Mm. Um, and that was a huge awakening for me. Um, you can call it a lot of things because it was also terrible, um, mm. especially because I told you I had a wonderful mother. Um, but that experience led me on a path to want to dive deep into understanding what it means to truly live. Mm -hmm. And I was already a very expressive person. Like I always like told people that I loved them. I was always a very like loving and expressive person. Mm -hmm. um, and so my mom's absence, my mom's death really propelled me on a path of healing um, and also propelled me on a path of speaking truth whenever possible, because you just never know. So her mm -hmm. death showed me, it wasn't like she was sick and I had all this time to prepare. It was like, she was there, she was healthy and then she was gone. And um, just the fragility of life and how quickly and easily we can, like something can go wrong, you know? And that, so I think that that, the mortality piece for me has really shaped who I have been over the last 16 years. Um, Cause that's, she died in 08. And so it's been 16 years in January, I think is the right, I think that's right. Math, math, <laughs> mathematically. <laughs> um, but yeah. And so, yeah, it's been a journey of self-discovery. Who am I without my mother? Who am mm -hmm. I without this anchor point? Um, the travels obviously were, you know, my big year around, your long trip with my husband around the world, um, was after my mom died. Um, and I had already been an adventurous person before that. I like moved to Brazil by myself after I graduated from college. And, um, so 
some things stayed the same and some things completely changed. Uh, but I, that's why the grief piece, why loss has also been a huge catalyst to my transformation because mm -hmm. I thought, how can I love my life again when I've been through something so excruciatingly painful that I thought for, for some time, I thought, I don't know if I'm ever going to be okay again, mm. you know, and that was a scary feeling for me. Um, as someone who had previously loved life a lot, mm -hmm. um, had like really juiced it for all it was worth, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, I've kind of lived my life. If this is it, then okay. You know, and you know, now it's been 16 years and gosh, my life is so rich and beautiful and robust. And I don't know if you've seen the movie inside out. Have you seen that? The kids um, yes mm -hmm. the Pixar movie like so in the in the first part of her life she has like a pretty limited um you know board you know with all the different emotions and like what she can experience and then she goes through puberty and her her board expands right she has mm -hmm. curse words that she can use if anybody hasn't seen inside out i highly recommend it is brilliantly done um and i i just heard yesterday that they're having inside out too which i'm so excited about but anyway i mean from a psychological perspective and a grief perspective i think they did a fabulous job um but anyway like she gets a new a new what's it called like the board like the mm -hmm. i want to call it the motherboard but <laughs> it's like the board that helps like like navigate all the feelings and like she's like oh now you get all the curse words and now you get to you like boys or girls or whatever and um and so i kind of feel like my mom's death created a whole new board for me that i hadn't had access to before um and it led to me writing a book that I, I don't, I don't know that I would have ever had the audacity to write a book mm. before that. Like I might've been like, Oh yeah, it'd be nice to write a book one day or whatever. But like I, through the experiences I had led to like me having the courage to write a book and it's called the compassion code, how to say the right thing when the wrong thing happens. And it was all from my own experience of being like, gosh, people feel so ill-equipped to deal with, with loss. Um, and I wanted to give people more resources because of what I had gone through and how I had felt and not knowing how to help other people for most of my life. And so, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, that all was kind of the catalyst for me to be who I am today and to walk the journey that I and that I am on. Well, isn't that the story of so many of us? What totally. you just described, right? <laughs> and even starting with the whole thing with writing a book, I can't tell you the number of times I have told myself, I can't tell you the number of times I've ever heard other people say the same exact thing. I want to write a book. In fact, I'll, I'll even say this, and I could probably even say this with confidence, that most of the people I know, one of the desires they have is to write a book, mm -hmm. but probably not something that they will actually do for the same exact reason. And it, it it's an interesting paradox to understand because I think should everyone write a book? Well, it's obviously up to them, but I absolutely. And I think the biggest reason for that is because every single one of us is living a journey that's never been lived before. Yeah. That's a fact. I mean, that's yeah. the thing that I, I used to forget. Oh man, someone's already done that. Someone's already said that. Someone's already experienced this. When the reality of the matter is they might have said things similar. <laughs> they might have experienced similar things, but no one has truly lived nor continues to live the perspective that you have. No one is experiencing the thoughts that you have. No one's finding all these creative ways to process those thoughts. Like that's the fascinating part that I think gets forgotten sometimes in, in just being humans is that yes, there are seven or 8 billion, however many people there are, but each one of them is unique. Right. And that's the crazy part. Yeah. Like every single, we're truly are not the same. No. We have similarities. Yeah. Simultaneously with all that uniqueness, we have certain things that create common humanity. Like our feelings are universal. Yes. You know, what brings us to them is totally different. We experience, like I could be like, oh, like, have you ever been mad? Yeah. Have you ever been sad? Yeah. Yes. Have you ever been excited? Yes. Have you ever been passionate? Yes. Have you ever been devastated? Of course. Mm -hmm. Like, and so I could ask every single human on earth if they've experienced those feelings, then every single person would say yes, right? Mm -hmm. So 
what the unique piece is, is what brought us to them. Mm -hmm. What brings us to those feelings? What brings us to like feel alive? Like what is alive for each of us is different. And that's Mm -hmm. awesome. Like that is the coolest thing in the world. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that's also what makes it really beautiful to experience the whole journey is that I think a, you, you truly never know how long you have. Mm -hmm. And as your story even the story that you shared, it's, it, 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 that's the, the mystery for all of us, right? Mystery. Some it could be hours, others, it could be years. And I think that's the thing that I started to realize and, and learn and really put into practice and even expressing a lot of these things is due to that knowing. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think it's a huge privilege. I think it's a huge privilege to be able to have your final days and to actually have some sort of choice in how you want to spend those remaining hours. I think that's a huge privilege that oftentimes doesn't go discussed Mm -hmm. because I mean, most times, you know, if you get hit by a bus, you get hit by a bus. Like Mm -hmm. it's not like beforehand you'd said, Oh, okay. I'm going to call my mom and I call my significant other. I'm going to do all these things. You just, some things truly do just happen. Um, And if anything, I think just not choosing to hold back and express these things is probably not only healthy for other people, but also healthy for yourself. Yeah. Well, it brings us to the precise reason why we got on this call in the first place, yeah. which was I wanted to talk to you and the people, whoever um, you are serving with this beautiful audio and um, podcast that you create is, you know, the value of saying all the unspoken things while someone is alive. Mm -hmm. and because when we don't say the unsaid things like when we leave things open and Mm -hmm. don't tell people how we feel about them especially those we love deeply um that's usually where unresolved grief comes from Mm -hmm. right and and that's a huge part of what i've done over the last you know many years as a grief specialist um is supported people to be able to say the unsaid things even when somebody has already died um, or is estranged, you know, because sometimes we have a living death, right, where somebody's alive, but we don't get to be in their lives anymore. When we go through a breakup is another mm. example. How many of your exes, like I'm very unique in the sense that I still have, uh, you know, communication with ex relationships. Um, and I can imagine that it would be excruciatingly painful to go from being best friends with somebody and having like, deep passion and love to not talking to them at all. Mm -hmm. or feeling like you're looking at them and they're alive, but like, it's like an empty, it's like, no, you, Mm -hmm. there's like nothing there anymore. And so, um, there can be living death as well. Um, but yeah, I just, I think that's why I love what you're doing so much with this moments to remember is that I think it gives people the chance to say those things in a really safe container, Mm -hmm. um, where they don't have to get rejected. (laughs) The person may or may not ever respond, but you're doing it because, you feel good being able to say the unsaid thing because the person who suffers, like when my mom died, I felt complete, not because I knew she was going to die, but because I had always said everything mm. that I felt. We had no unresolved communications. I, she knew exactly how I felt about her. I knew exactly how she felt about me. The unresolved, the grief that has come for me over the years is all the new experiences that happened that she couldn't participate in like having, getting married, traveling the world, having babies, right? Like running a business, writing a book, all the things that I like have experienced and done that Mm -hmm. I'm like, God, I would love to share this with my living mother and she can't be here to receive it. Like I I have a spiritual practice where I believe that she's with me, but it's not the same as having that tangible relationship in the 3D reality, right? And so when people have unresolved, like, you know, communications that is one of the biggest things that leads to unresolved grief um Mm. which can be unbearable um and so you know what you're doing is giving people both the person who receives it while they're alive amazing gift and the person who says it Mm -hmm. an amazing gift that they might not get otherwise because you otherwise don't usually get to know what people will say at your funeral Mm -mm. I mean, a hundred percent of the time you think you don't, right? Well, that's the only time we collect those things, right? Because my, on my 38th birthday, um, my husband, 
emailed every single person or texted as many people as he could think of who loved me. And he said, I, it was in the, during the pandemic. Um, and he said, I want you to write Laura a letter about what she means to you. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a version of what you did. Mm -hmm. And so we received, and I didn't know. So every day he would collect the mail without me knowing. Um, but it was a way for us to celebrate him to celebrate me. So on my birthday, I got over 150 letters, wow. from handwritten letters from friends from every part of my life, family members. Um, and it was one of the most special gifts of my entire life was having that. And I have it all, he put it into a binder. So I have all the letters compiled into one space. It's not, obviously it's not the same as um, mm -hmm. videos and all that kind of stuff because that would also be extremely special um, but this was a, a step in that direction where I'm like wow I I knew that I meant so much to this person but like to receive the words mm -hmm. it's like forever it feels like forever mm -hmm. well also I think to some degree at least what I've learned is that you can have a really deep and, and meaningful connection but I mean, just think about like how we connect with people and I don't know how you do it, but for me, I have a lot of deep and meaningful connections that I have, but we rarely at any point of the conversation, do we go into, you know, here's what I learned from you. Or if it wasn't if it wasn't for you doing this, I'd be, it's just, it's almost like it's acknowledged, but it's not stated. And and then it goes into this kind of space of the unknowing, the assumptions, which may or may not be spot on because I might feel this one way. And then, as you said many times throughout this, like the other person might not. So mm -hmm. unless you take the time to really say, hey, Laura, thank you for writing that. Like, thank you for taking the time out of your life and answering this whatever question like what do i mean to you why am i special am i special to you what about it that that you most appreciate right what brings you to tears what what gives you strength what gives you hope and i think it's in until you take this take a moment to really reflect and otherwise those things go on on set and unnoticed i agree totally. how do how do people connect with you? What do you have going on as part of the work? Is there anything that people can interact, engage in webinars, yeah. anything like that? Yeah. So I have, um, I have quite a few ways that people can connect, but laurajack.com is the easiest. That's just my website. And it's a way that they can find most of my resources. Like I, I have a lot of free resources that I do. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, so I have this thing called the Compassion Collective, which is kind of a membership. And this might be something that you would think would be interesting, but it's a way for people to call in and receive unconditional love and, and support. I'm going to write this down. And Compassion so I'll, Collective. Send, okay. yeah, I'll send you the link to it, but um, I offer the first month for free. And so I'll send you a coupon code for any of your listeners if they want to uh, join for free for a month. It's actually uh -huh. tomorrow. So <laughs> I don't know for anybody else, but maybe you can join us. Um, but essentially I do a meditation and then I do a teaching around something that, you know, this right now, this month, we're going to be talking about how to navigate the holidays with authenticity and self preservation and self-love mm -hmm. and kindness for other people. So like, how do we stand up for ourselves with kindness? How do we have those healthy boundaries? But also like, how do we do that in a way that like honors and supports us as going into like, you know, the family dynamics or missing the family or somebody's dead or, you know, whatever, because there's the families bring up a lot of complicated feelings for a lot of people. So that's going to be tomorrow's. And then I do live coaching Mm. where people can uh, receive that unconditional loving support. And so I'll send you the link to that. And that's a kind Perfect. of a wonderful way for people to engage if if they feel like they would really like something like that. Um, and I'll send you, I have a little video that's um, the most important shift that somebody can make to have authentic happiness and success. It's a little like 15 minute video that I can send you um, mm -hmm. because it really, it comes back to, some of the things that we're talking about today. And actually, um, I think you particularly will resonate with what you said at the beginning of the call about coming home after living, you know, traveling the world and having a whole new perception about what success meant 
um, about what meaning and purpose meant, because that is a lot about what this is, is like the old paradigm of like, do this and do this and check all these boxes. And then one day you'll be happy and successful, hopefully success. Well, it's usually successful and then hopefully happy. Um, and I have a kind of a paradigm shift that flips that on its head. That's like, we need to stop checking boxes because you know, it's not serving us as a society.